start uh, right on, on time. So everything will start in about in, in a minute. I see you are having a presentation here. I'll add the presentation to the stream. And uh, I will remove myself from, from this and you, you can start. You both are on, on the stage and with your mic, so you can exchange the speaker as, as you like. Oh, thank I you, George. Is, thank you. Everything is almost ready. And we'll start in 15 seconds. So Ooh, it will be easier for the people <laughs> <laughs> cutting the videos if we have this on time. So the stage is yours. Have a nice presentation. Thank you. Oh, good morning, good evening, good night, uh, previous speaker. Um, so welcome at this presentation with the Link Data 101. Uh, it's uh, we're going to present um, a bit of the program. Um, so let me start with a bit of context. So I'm, I'm Paul van Genuchte. I work at the Israel World Soil Information, and uh, I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I'm really the spatial uh, person here. So I do SDI OGC standardization for over 10 years, and I'm in the, the project steering committee of, of Geo Network and PyGeo API. And Marco. Hi, uh, I'm Marco Neumann. My, uh, I'm an information scientist with Kona. Kona is a semantic technology company based in New York City. And we're walking out of New York and Dublin, Ireland. Um, I'm a semantic technology expert. And especially for today, I'm the creator of geosparkle.org, which is a spatial web query service. Okay, so so how do we come together in this room? So uh, we met uh, in in spring this year at the virtual OGC API uh, code sprint, and uh, we had a very interesting discussion. And I say, oh, Marco, you really need to join with me in this presentation for the fast 4 G, um, because I have some questions for you. And so that's what this presentation uh, will be about. So for me, this started uh, around 2016. This is me presenting at the fast 4 g in Bonn. Um, and I presented this picture, which was uh, is, is created by Linda van der Brink from, from Geenhoven. And uh, she really expressed nicely how, how the WWW internet, kind of the, the search engines and so on, uh, looked at the at the uh, OGC world. So the, there was kind of a barrier between the two worlds. And uh, that was for her the, the, uh, the trigger to start uh, the OGC uh, or the Geo on the web uh, testbed. And on the testbed, there was uh, one, one of the test that we run was me and Clemens and, uh, and uh, some others uh, that created a proxy layer on top of the typical SDI. So there is uh, the SDI of WMS and WFS, and then we created a proxy on top of that to provide the data to, to search engines and web developers. And what, what, what learn what did that give us as a learning experience is that we are actually quite good in, in sharing data because we're very standardized. We, we have a very standardized uh, community. Um, however, we do not speak the language of the others, so we need a proxy layer to, to engage with them. Actually, from that, that this was one of the exercises of the of the OGC and W3C working group on on uh, spatial data on the web, and uh, they came up with a report almost a year later, and and with these best practices, and this is a good read. You have to read it at some point. If you look at those best practices, you will notice that quite some of them are are very linked data oriented, and um, um, so. If, if we draw that in a schema, so on, on one hand, there's our OGC OWS world, and on the other side, there's the RDF kind of pulling us in. Come on, guys, we, we want more of you. And then, then you come in kind of a balancing situation. So how much of that linked data are we going to implement in our, in our new generation of standards? And this is OGC API kind of landed somewhere in the middle. So, so we have we're a lot closer to the linked data and web world than we used to be, but we're not fully there. We're not fully compliant. So then the, the big question is: Should we do more linked data than than OGC API does? And then, for example, we could do a JSON LD profile of OGC API features and records, or we can do a turtle output encoding for 
by JAPI. Turtle is a, is a very common uh, encoding in, uh, in, in linked data. Or should GeoServer have a Sparkle endpoint? Would that solve things? So that's actually my question to Marco. Marco, would this th these things help you to, to get more uh, better access to our data? But first, um, we're in a linked data 101, so, so we're going to do some basic concepts of RDF. What, what, is, what is that RDF world? So this is the, 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 the picture that, that a lot of you must have seen. Um, the, the linked data world is based on, on triplets. So there is an object, and there is a predicate, and there is a subject. Um, and the predicate links the objects and the subject uh, together. For example, my name is Alice, age is 18, and uh, I know Bob, whose age is 22. And um, if you have a lot of these, these triples together, you, you arrive in a big network of links. So it's one massive big cloud of data, um, uh, totally linked with, uh, uh, with build on triples. Um, so we, as a geo, have our, our typical uh, relational database where we have our data. And the cloud of data next to us is, um, um, is out there. So, so how do we relate to each other? Now, for example, I put my house on the web uh, from my uh, uh, address registration uh, of a local community, for example. And then um, somebody uh, puts a tweet, hey, there's a broken street light uh, near that address. Or somebody else says, hey, that house was designed by uh, Mr. XXX in 1812 on Wikipedia. And somebody else said, hey, that I, uh, I have a shop or registered at that address. So, you know, so, so once we put that house there on the cloud, it started to, a cloud of data started to build around that one. But we, for us, that, that house still lives in our local registration. How can we get all that new knowledge that developed around our data set into our work processes? That, that's really, or even worse, what if we put a new version of that shapefile online and the house is no longer there? We're actually breaking down uh, knowledge that was built up on in the cloud. So, so linked data is already happening around us without us, us knowing, actually. So that, that's the, the main, main uh, bit of introduction on linked data. So here I try to put a very descriptive, very, very non-precise, uh, some of the concepts used in the, in the linked data world, and then a bit of the representation of the same thing in our uh, UML geospatial world. So the triple, that's uh, uh, what we would call a feature attribute. An RDF, uh, the framework, uh, that's what we would do, uh, call a relational database. A graph is a collection of triples, so that's data in general. Uh, a triple store would be a persistence for triples or a database. Um, URI, the identifier, that would be the ID attribute in our world. Sparkle, our, the query language in, in uh, linked data, would be SQL on our side. Uh, ontology would be a data model, the schema. OWL would be the, the syntax to describe the ontology uh, for us, UML, XSD, and encoding serialization. Uh, yeah, so any RDF structure can be can be expressed in either JSON-LD, Turtle, or RDF XML without loss of information. We don't really have that on our side. We, of course, GeoServer can render as XML or JSON, but you will notice that that sometimes uh, things are missing. Um, this, you probably must have seen this picture, um, the five star linked data uh, world. So uh, the PDF, one star, a star unstructured. Then there is the Excel file, uh, two stars. It is structured data in table, in table form. There's CSV, so uh, then it, it's an open data format. Um, and then there is four uh, talking the, um, using the, the OGC, uh, the, the linked data standards. I actually have a slide on that. Um, one of the aspects of that is that uh, each feature has a unique uh, URI, uh, use a uh, uh, URL, um, and that, that URI should be uh, on the web, unambiguous, and, and simple and stable. 
And uh, one of the very concrete uh, tips there would be uh, prevent organizational product and project names in your URL. So if you install GeoServer locally, never name the URL GeoServer, but name it something like data or, or catalog or whatever. And then uh, that URL above URIs has a very good um, expression on on uh, that URLs. Uh, yeah, that the, the the thing in the real world is not the same thing as we describe it on the web. So that's also an interesting read. And then five star link data. Um, link your data to other uh, objects. And uh, one of the uh, ways to do it is to use a common ontology to describe the data and reuse existing Wikipedia identifiers. So for example, if you put a data set with, with uh, cities on the, on, uh, on the internet, then you could reference the, the same cities on Wikipedia and already create these links between uh, the two concepts. So then you would have the definition of the city on Wikipedia and the geometry of it on your uh, end of the uh, side. So a couple of use cases quickly, because we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, how can I create RDF data from table data? So one of the simple approaches there is, is that you uh, define uh, an ontological, uh, ontological item uh, for the table, say for example, schema.org product and uh, you create a URI based on the, the item ID and uh, each of the columns uh, ends up as, as a predicate from a common ontology, for example, schema.org. So how would that work out in practice? Is that, for example, you have this JSON object and you add a context on top of it, indicating these fields. Okay, name in my uh, database is actually schema.org name. And this is what JSON-LD does. So JSON-LD is a very uh, basic implementation uh, based on this principle. There's a couple of, of software around there which, which applies this, this approach. There's Fiona, the Python library. There's the D2RQ, uh, there's PyJ API, and there's GeoServer that, that currently implement uh, this uh, type of uh, GeoJSON-LD export. Second case, so how can we consume RDF data within our existing GIS desktop tooling? There's actually a very nice uh, experimental plugin for QGIS that is called uh, Sparkle Unicorn that allows you to write out the Sparkle query in a QGIS plugin and display that result onto the QGIS map. So that's uh, quite a nice plugin. And then case three is where you actually go into the Sparkle engine and write out your uh, uh, spatial query combined with uh, an, uh, other uh, filters to actually fetch uh, the specific data that you need in your uh, project. So that was a very fast introduction to, to, to Link Data 101. So I now give the floor to Marco to answer our question. Is this enough for you? Or should we go further? Thank you, Paul. Very well done. Uh, very quick introduction. Uh, before I go into GeoSparkle, I'd like to uh, move uh, forward to the next slide and just re-emphasize uh, the importance of this five-star model. First, Get your data out to the web. Second, make it machine readable. And third, possibly in a non-proprietary format. That already allows us to access your data. In the fourth step, you can actually make use of RDF standards. And if you encode your data in RDF, we can actually access your data much more easily. And now in a fifth step, you can actually make your data linked now and make it resolvable. That will actually help us then to mesh up the data even better and get all this data together. So these um, five levels are actually a very important aspect of linked open data. Now, if you move to the next slide, please, Paul. Um, 
where once we have this linked data, we can actually now do some of the geospatial stuff that um, Paul spoke about earlier. Just a little bit of history. When I started 20 years ago to work on uh, spatial standards for RDF, I was confronted with the world of SQL or SQL, uh, spatial, sim simple feature standard um, that was released in 1999. And my approach was to bring data to the web and make data accessible as RDF. So I created a layer of RDF spatial data that could be accessed through the web, but had still a, a, a separate layer of spatial evaluations. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to get in the spatial properties into the query language and apply them to predicate functions and to filter functions. And that is something we have introduced in 2007 with uh, the platform called Jenna. And we actually released a web service called geosparkle.org. And that is uh, basically the forerunner to what came later, which is the OGC Geosparkle standardization, which is now a whole standard around our initial setup of working with spatial data within RDF with a query language on top of Sparkle. And in um, it took us only um, approximately seven years <laughs> to go from the GeoSparkle standard to a almost fully compliant OGC GeoSparkle uh, implementation in Jenna. Uh, we have recently uh, run a, a GeoSparkle compliance uh, test with all the available triple stores um, in the marketplace. And uh, Jenna GeoSparker came actually uh, out on the top at the moment. It, uh, it actually satisfied quite, satisfies quite a number of requirements that are specified within the G OGC GeoSparker standard. Now, if you please move forward to the next slide. Now, what is the OGC GeoSparker standard? It specifies six components. And it has the core, which is very simple. It just defines a spatial uh, feature um, that uh, represents any spatial object and a feature. So these two, two classes represent the core of the GeoSparkle standard. And on top of that, we have the topology vocabulary extension, which allows us to relate these spatial objects to each other. In the third component, we actually add geometry information to, um, to the vocabulary so that we can uh, express um, objects at lines and points and polygons, etc. And once we have the geometries in the vocabulary, we also want to apply the geometry topology extension now to the geometries. So we want to ask questions like, uh, does this point intersect with another object? How far is this point? Uh, what's the distance between two points? Do we have an intersection between a line and a polygon, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, if you move to the next slide, please, Paul. Um, you can think of this, uh, these, these components as a vocabulary, as a schema that you can represent in a big word, which is ontology. So what you'll see here in the screen is the ontology, the representation of these classes and properties, so their relationships in a ontology tool, which uh, in this case is Top Rate Life, which allows you to visualize them and use this vocabulary to annotate your data. Now, please move to the next slide. And the last two components are the RDFS entailment regime and the query rewrite extension. So RDFS allows you to um, in create data that is not explicitly expressed within the data set, but can implicitly be generated from the existing data in the data set. The query rewriting extension uh, gives you even more flexibility. It allows you to uh, rewrite arbitrary relationship between spatial objects into a new triple, in, so you materialize new data into the store. 
And um, these are the six components. You don't actually have to, you know, use all of them. Um, you can actually take the ones that you're interested in and then use them in your specific projects. So for example, RDFS entailment is not necessarily something you always want to use within a public uh, endpoint or even within an enterprise endpoint, but you would like to make use of geospatial functions. Now, if you uh, move forward, please, to the next slide, um, to give you a flavor of what this looks like, we have the, the geosparkle.org web service. As I mentioned earlier, it's already running since 2007, but has been updated. Uh, most recently, it was the latest uh, release of the Fuseki Geosparkle implementation by the Jenna project, which implements the Geosparkle standard. And you can uh, go ahead and uh, do some uh, queries um, within this, um, uh, you know, tool. Okay, I think uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, we are actually already at the end of my slides. And with that, I think we can take some more questions. Yes, a lot of room for discussion. So I think, um, yeah. Thank you very much. So if, if you have your venulas open, you can check the questions there. So if not, I, I, can, I can read the questions for you. Please, uh, yeah. the, first one, the first one was related to Inspire. And the question is, is Inspire already uh, a proper link of the data? No, the answer is... The answer is no. So, so. Uh, however, but okay. Let, let me first. The Inspire, the, the typical Inspire, is a typical example of the the, the previous OWS approach, where there is WFS and uh, XSD UML. However, within the Inspire scope, there's a, currently a lot of research to see if if uh, they can adopt also RDF ontologies. As, a, as an alternative uh, for download services. So uh, uh, that's actually a very good uh, initiative to, to uh, uh, make Inspire more um, also open to that uh, community. Okay, maybe the next question, maybe for Marco, why it took seven years to become almost a full OGC compliant? What were the difficulties? It's a good question. You know, when I spoke with the Dew Sparker team in 2012, I asked them why it took five years to standardize Dew Sparker. <laughs> we already had the runtime system in 2007. And you know what? I think you have to appreciate the work that went into the standard. It's, uh, it is well uh, put together. Um, it introduces the geo community to a, a new world of this um, semantic web and RDF. And it, uh, it, it's an impotence mismatch. If you come out of a relational world, if you come out of the geo world, this all looks a little bit um, different and you might not see points to latch on to. And um, so the release that we had out in 2012 service 90% of the use cases. I could say 99% of the use cases, which were proximity searches or, um, you know, address lookups and things like that, that customers actually used. So the, um, we didn't have that much uh, requ requests for um, the relationship uh, um, evaluation of, of geometric features. I think that's something that is... Um, that you have to grow with your application. So you add new services to your application, and now you finally have actually a use case where you would like to evaluate spatial properties. Um, and, um, you know, it might have been also a, a little bit of an academic topic. Uh, uh, and so the application wasn't um, at the center of, uh, of the uh, application. Uh, but that has changed now. So we see a lot of web services like um, GeoNames, Wikidata. I think Wikidata has almost seven or eight million spatial features. Uh, 
uh, with geometries uh, in the data set. Uh, and now people want to do interesting queries. You know, um, I just in recently implemented a query where I ask um, the system which European capital is closest to each other or which two European capitals are the closest to each other. So I could now render the data out of Wikidata, but they don't have a distance function readily available with GeoSparkle. So I can pull that data into my GeoSparkle endpoint and compute this over my data set and give you the result. So which um, which is which European capitals are the closest to each other? What would you say in in kilometer? Do you have a, a guess in the in the questions maybe in the chat? Okay, uh, the answer is Vienna and Bratislava. Right, so they are actually the closest to each other, but you can compute that for all the Euro, all the twenty seven uh, European capitals, um, and you leverage the network effect of the data. Right, I can now pull the data out of Wikidata into my local silo and then um, generate queries. I think that is explains a little bit um, why it took seven years. Um, I think we have to grow with the features. Not everybody is yet aware of what they can do with uh, these tools. Marco, the answer on the chat was uh, uh, London, Paris. I think. <laughs> They're very close. Well, it's not, <laughs> not in uh, uh, not in a geo uh, spatial sense. Huh? Uh, possibly, um, you know, in other ways, but uh, fishing. Uh, <laughs> So the semantics of the distance is important. <laughs> what is the distance? So uh, going to to a next question is is related with the, and this is a one on one presentation is related with the difficulty to have these tools and these these powerful tools in, in QGIS uh, in desktop tools like QGIS and ArcGIS and so on. Why is so difficult to have the the ability to use these queries on the desktop GIS? So, so let me try to answer that. Um, uh, the, the whole concept behind linked data is is that uh, data entry is very simple because you are not tied to a specific uh, database model. So you can put almost any data on the cloud quite easily. The complexity of querying, uh, uh, of making a good query is, is more on the analysis part. So, so creating a good G, uh, Sparkle query is actually quite an advanced uh, topic. And uh, it's part of the, the paradigm uh, difference between linked data and, and more UML XSD uh, data. That means that if we create, if we create a, the, the Sparkle Unicorn uh, uh, client in QGIS, the, the only way to get, uh, 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 well, yeah, you still have to enter the, the Sparkle query manually, which which is a quite uh, um, quite a difficult uh, process. But as soon as then the result comes in, then we can easily display it. So that, so that's not a problem. But creating that that Sparkle query, there's a lot of research on on on. Uh, uh, creating wizards to create Sparkle queries, um, but uh, um, uh, outside uh, in the linked data world itself. But uh, for, for now, uh, such a thing has not landed on QGIS uh, yet. So you have to really create that. Uh, maybe you want to comment, Marco, on, on creating Sparkle queries? I can go straight to, into the next question. Um, you know, do I need to understand RDF uh, to make use of the data? Uh, no. You know, think of the result set as a table, and re you can reuse that data straight away into your uh, processing application. Obviously, if you want to access the meaning of that data, you better understand uh, how your eyes work and how you can look up additional data um, somewhere else. But uh, in principle, um, you can just um, you know issue a query and get a table as a result set and, or a JSON object and then read out the data that you would like to make use of. Um, there is one uh, last question, uh, which is uh, with regards to uh, label property graphs. You know, there is, there is um, 
uh, is currently, um, you know, actually a working group around that that allows you to work with uh, labor property graphs in within the RDF constraints. But I understand there's also um, the the world of uh, property graphs that um, have their own um, query languages, and they are they can be quite attractive, but they will be uh, they will fall short on data exchange on the web so uh, you still have to represent the data in rdf and that might be uh, less efficient with a property graph uh, runtime there's actually i i jumped one um question which is rdf lacks consistency checks i you know that is a very old question, and you must be a relational database person uh, because that is a question I have received for the last 20 years from my database people. You know, can we do consistency checks? Um, is, you know, there is actually a standard called Shackle in checks, and they will allow you to build shapes around your RDF data that can act as a form of consistency check as well. So, Marco, thank you very much. I think Paul went out for some reason, lost connection, but you, you were answering the questions and, and very well. And thank you very much for your presentation and for answering uh, so many questions. So, thank, thank you. Thank you all for you know, uh, taking the time today to uh, run the session. I'd like to thank Paul who really uh, started the conversation here to run this workshop. I'm very happy to engage with the GEO community. And also, you know, we can learn a lot from the tools uh, that are coming online now. I'm using QGIS, for example, to export a well-known text into GeoSparkle RDF, and it works like a charm. So it's, it's really nice to see that it all comes together. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg.